Thank you for joining us today for this EWA panel, What Reporters Need to Know About State Testing in 2021. I'm Eric Roblin, the Deputy Director at EWA, and I'll be the moderator for this session. Before we begin, a few housekeeping notes. First, this session is being recorded. Everything is on the record, chats included. If you hover over the speaker screen, you should see a button for closed captioning and live transcript. To start viewing closed captioning, just click closed caption. To view the live transcript, click live transcript and then select show subtitle. To submit a question for our speakers, use the chat box in the Plathable platform. You can submit questions at any point. An EWA staffer, my colleague Stacia, will monitor questions and will facilitate Q&A later in the session. Finally, to tweet about this session, use the hashtag EWA21. Now, let me introduce today's speakers. We have uh, Andrew Ho, who is a professor of education at Harvard University, a national testing expert, and also a member of the National Assessment Governing Board, which sets policy for NAEP. Um, before attending grad school, before his work as, a, as an assessment analyst, he taught middle school creative writing in his hometown of Honolulu and also high school physics in California. We are also joined by Scott Marion, the executive director of the Center for Assessment, where he works closely with state education chiefs, legislators, state and district testing officials, and many others. He also serves on numerous state technical advisory boards for assessments and accountability. Among Scott's prior positions was a state testing director in Wyoming. Um, we also have with us, and I want to make sure that she is now fully present. Yes, she is. Hello, Lynn. Uh, we also have uh, Lynn Vasquez, the state assessment director at the New Mexico Public Education Department. She has served in a variety of posts in her career, including at the Maryland Department of Education, the Kansas Department of Education, and she too was previously a classroom teacher in her case for six years. As you know, the pandemic did not just disrupt in-person schooling, it also halted statewide assessments in 2020, as the US Department of Education told states they could skip their summative testing this year. To the surprise of some educators and analysts, the Biden administration decided that states could not take a pass in 2021. That said, it has provided some flexibility. Our panel today is intended to help journalists understand the state of play with large-scale assessments in 2021, the strengths and limitations of state testing. Uh, they also will offer advice on interpreting test results. After all, journalists play a very important role in helping the public understand testing and reporting on the results uh, for the public. So uh, let's get started. I'm going to start with a question. Um, we're going to we're not going to have opening remarks, but I'll, I'll, I'll ask a few questions of individual speakers and then the group and then we'll uh, go to audience Q&A. Um, Andrew, you recently put forward a provocative proposal to rethink state testing in 2021. You, re you wrote that testing is necessary, feasible and even humane as long as it's flexible. Can you briefly tell us about your idea? and why you think it's worth a try. Yeah, thank you, Eric, and, and hello to everybody. Um, I'm sorry we can't, we can't do this in, in person. Um, I, I think my remarks actually reflect a, a hidden consensus among a lot of people who do work in testing, uh, and I include many policymakers, including Secretary Cardona today. Um, in his remarks today, the Secretary said that there's, he doesn't expect any teacher to find use in these state tests. They already know. That said, this information can be, can be valuable to policymakers as they seek to provide support to those who need it most. And, and, as, and so if we sort of step back and see that testing can be, again, quite a question mark on can, can be potentially used as one of many multiple measures to direct support thoughtfully, then you can sort of see it as part of what I like to think of as an educational census, where we bring all data on deck to mix metaphors, right? Bring all data on deck, right? To, to answer the question about how we can direct this unprecedented amount of, of federal funding that we have. Do we already know some things? Yes, we absolutely do. That said, there is authority and comparability in state tests that used wisely, right, can help us direct 
funds, I believe, wisely. Now, there's there, there's a there's a can that I said there, <laughs> and I see Scott already waiting to jump in because he knows right that if you report scores this year, like we would ordinarily do. I've described this as like the Titanic heading for the iceberg, right? <laughs> right? We can't just do things as usual because heads up, we're missing unpredictable numbers of students. And I'm not just talking about the students who aren't in school. I'm talking also about the students who might be testing remotely and we don't actually know if their scores are comparable yet, right? right? So we have an unknown amount of incomparable data. So we have to, as Eric was emphasizing, be flexible in our reporting and make sure that we use wise metrics that compare apples to apples and, and doesn't think that we don't think that the, the population this year is the same as a population two years ago. So thanks to the incredible support of the federal government and folks like Scott and Lynn and all their, all their state um, agencies and, and, and supports, we actually have extremely rich longitudinal data that can help us to figure out who's here and who's not, a census before an assessment, who is here, right? And that's the first question we should ask. Once we ask that question, we can be much smarter, I think, about trying to direct, trying to figure out who needs the most support and then directing funding to those schools and to those communities. So you've seen, um, I think you've seen on, on Twitter, otherwise I can share it in, in the link. I have a technical memo that's basically just like, and, and Scott knows this and Lynn knows this, there are so potential solutions to the problem of this changing population, right? And we just have to be flexible and smart and have foresight about how to report the scores to answer the questions questions, who needs help most, or the question, who needs help most, which I presume is why we're testing this year, right? First first question, why are you testing? And if, if, if the answer is to direct support to folks who need it most, state tests, I think, can be part of an educational census that helps us to answer that question. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, so Scott, um, tell us a little bit about, I mean, states are in different places, you know, the federal government gave them some flexibility what are you seeing out there? What are some trends of things they're doing that are alike? Are there some notable differences across states? Um, and then, you know, what do you like and, and maybe what gives you pause or keeps you up at night about strategies you're seeing? We don't have long enough for what keeps me up at night with, with this year's <laughs> testing. And, and Andrew started to lay out some of that. He was very careful about you can or you might be able to. And it's all those things that, that keep us up at night ar around those edges, like figuring that out. Um, the federal government was uh, not very generous on assessment flexibility. They were generous on accountability flexibility. That's very important. People often conflate, conflate assessment and accountability like it's one long word. And it's the accountability is how the scores are used. And, and they essentially, every state that wants to waive school accountability, holding schools accountable for student performance this year has been able to do so. And perhaps most importantly attached to that is what we call the 95% requirement where there's strict penalties in terms of your achievement indicator if you go below 95%. So states have been able to waive that. Now, many states are going to test close to 95%. There's states that have been in person for a good chunk of the year. Some states will test 10 to 20% because they haven't been in person and there's, uh, they've been trying, the districts and others know they've been going for this flexibility. The two uh, perhaps most interesting states in terms of doing something different are Colorado and Oregon. They're not testing every kid, every grade on the same test. So Colorado is testing, I think it's third, fifth, seventh uh, in English language arts fourth, sixth, and eighth in math. I could have flipped those. Oregon is doing something similar. And so we'll, we'll have some interesting uh, answers to interesting questions about what happens to your inferences about equity and things like that when you move away from the no child left behind approach to testing. Um, and, and like Andrew said, you know, the biggest thing that keeps me up at night is figuring out um, what these scores mean. And Andrew talks about census before test. And, and so what I would say to reporters out there, if, if you get a score report or in a press release that tells you that 40% of kids this year are proficient compared to 60% 2019 or vice versa, 
and you can't easily see what proportion of kids tested if, for overall and for each subgroup, I would not even go near that story until you could get that information. So we say description before inference. You have to have a clear description of the sample. And as reporters, uh, it's, and, and you press to your editors, it's up to you guys to make sure that that information is probably presented first, then talk about the, the scores. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Lynn, um, tell us about testing this year in New Mexico. You know, when is it happening? How is it different? And, and how did you decide on the approach that you're bringing? Yeah, I really appreciate the question, Eric. And again, thanks for this medium to really help inform uh, the media and, and different avenues and context of states. And so we were, Scott eloquently put the difference between the assessment waiver and the accountability waiver as a state, knowing the context of New Mexico, a high um, a minority being the majority population, knowing that our Native American communities often live in multi-generational homes, knowing that we had vulnerable populations of COVID. We, um, uh, in our huddle, you know, we discussed kind of what were our pathways to move forward. It did not seem realistic, nor that it would give serve our constituents the best if we decided to go ahead and be uh, uh, straight ahead and try to meet that 95% federal requirement. So we actually had went down the pathway of, of applying for an assessment waiver. Um, and then after a call with the Department of Ed, as well as sometime between when we originally submitted for the assessment waiver, the Department of Ed came out with the accountability waiver. And we realized that uh, we could redact our assessment waiver and just simply apply for the accountability waiver, uh, acknowledging that we were not going to test 95% of our students but still uh, move forward with allowing families to have access to testing. So we actually have an opt-in model where we have uh, made all of our federal assessments available, but we also made available our interim assessments because again, I'm sure you'll get into this later, Eric, depending on kind of state's perspectives on that multiple sources of data that Andrew spoke to, we wanted to make sure that our schools had access to a variety of assessment uh, resources or instruments that they could use depending on whether we decided as a state to give our state assessments remotely or not. And I, and I think one of the things that I would underscore for media is to really know your state context, whatever state that you are reporting on, know the intricacies. It's one of those unusual circumstances in which um, the difference between uh, administering an assessment remotely or some just to state said, no, we didn't think that was the best path forward. So students actually had to come in in person to the administered assessments. All those nuances matter for what Scott spoke about, about the contextualization on the reporting. So when we do report, uh, we want to identify those confounding variables. And so for our state, for New Mexico, for um, a population of students that with 25 percent that did not have broadband or internet access, for a state in which we had um, some of the the uh, largest minority population groups impacted by COVID. For a state in which we know that our districts were all over the place in terms of how much standards were being covered, all that feeds into what we talk about often as opportunity to learn. Um, and so we move forward with uh, the idea of having parents be able to opt in. We wanted district to have thoughtful conversations with families, all families, uh, needed to have had the opportunity to, to participate in testing. And uh, to Scott's point, we know that based on our, because we're currently in the window, based on what we're seeing in terms of participation, we're probably right in that spot of what we expected, somewhere between 15 to 20% of our students actually participating in a testing event. Mm -hmm. Wow. So that's a lot less than usual, right? I mean, usually it would be close to 95%. And Correct. did you hear much from families? So if it's opt-in, you're saying it's it was literally up to families to decide, um, if I'm understanding you correctly, which is really interesting. Because <laughs> um, we've heard about over the years, the opt-out movement. Yeah, right? In other states, they're exercising the opt-out. Don't worry. <laughs> <In certain states. laughs> yeah, that's kind of flipping the script on it, isn't it? Yeah. 
And so I, I would also say that, um, again, this is why I emphasize that the contextualization and knowing each state circumstances matter. For example, um, we have not administered, been able to administer or an operationalized science assessment in New Mexico. Um, uh, last year would have been our first operational year, but we were impacted by the uh, uh, COVID pandemic when all assessments were canceled. And so we don't have the ability to have cut scores to uh, look at or to be able to provide uh, adequate reporting. And so we, one of the, the it, when we talk about assessment literacy and, and we do a lot of work with Scott's organization around this, but it adds a little nuance. It adds the complication of if parents aren't going to get actual reports that are meaningful in science, do they want their students to participate? And so again, that might be unique just to us or maybe a couple other states, depending on where they were with developing new assessments. But we felt obligated, we wanted to make sure that our districts understood if you take, if you, if you say yes, or if you're if you you participate in this test, what will you get back at the end? And will that be meaningful? And if for some parents, did that make, did that add to their decision about testing? And we believe that it, it did and it, that it should have. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Lynn. This is really interesting. And it sounds like a question that a reporter might want to ask in their state is, you know, did you do an opt-in or, or what was even, you know, were parents in some way empowered around the decision to participate in testing? Because that's really interesting given that in the past, it's mainly been those who, you know, kind of in a form of almost activism, pull their kids out of the testing. Um, I wanna ask about, um, you tweeted a little bit earlier today, Andrew, about um, the speech from Secretary Cardona. I'm just wondering if, if you want, you know, and, and thinking about assessing, do you wanna assess, did the, has the Biden administration in your view struck the right balance in its stance on state testing? And, and I'll, I'll invite others to weigh in too, but maybe you could start, Andrew. So this is a this is a tricky question, right? I I, I believe they did um, uh, because it was um, a sort of po a politically viable solution that maximized um, apparent flexibility to states while still encouraging centralized data collection. If you if you ask me, I mean, I, I I'm not in this position, but it is what I would have done. Um, the, I think what is is challenging is, and, and Scott said this, and this is sort of a mantra in our field, that because of the overuse of state standardized tests over the past 20, arguably 40, 50 years, um, there has been a blurring between assessment and accountability. So I think the one um, uh, opportunity they missed was to emphasize the waiver, the accountability waiver, to emphasize that not just they are allowing people to, to waive account to states to waive accountability, but that they encourage it, right? That is what I, that's where I would have gone further because there is no technical basis in my opinion for continuing accountability uses of tests in this year, right? And so, and so instead of just allowing for it to actually have taken the proactive step to emphasize that they encourage it, right? I think would have been able to, 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 to allow tests to be used in a more responsible way, which most states, uh, in, including Lynn, uh, Lynn State, uh, are taking advantage of. Um, and so I think they, they missed a signaling opportunity, not to mention a technical opportunity to improve the, the, the validity of their, of their test uses, um, to push back against accountability uses where they have no technical warrant this year. Okay, thank you. Scott, do you want to share any thoughts about on um, whether they, they kind of got the right balance at the in the administration? I think they took got the balance that they could get. Um, I, I would have pushed, I, I have been, it's not a secret, I've written a lot about this, I would have pushed for more flexibility. Um, I don't understand, for instance, I understand why Washington DC got a complete waiver because they had 88% of their kids in remote settings. I don't understand why a state like Michigan doesn't get the same waiver, where it's the most uh, severe outbreak of COVID that we had, you know, during the testing window, and Detroit shut down, for instance. So th there was inconsistency that I didn't understand, and I guess I, <laughs> Andrew, will probably like this. I've been on a rant against labels, you know, whether you call it diagnostic assessment <laughs> or. Um, form of assessment. I just want to know what you're doing with the data, what you plan to do with the data, right? And 
So I think ahead, thought, so what am I gonna do with these data? And I, I'm also nuts enough that I'm on my local school board. So I think about you know, school improvement cycles and things like that. And these state aggregate data, especially if you follow the advice of people like Andrew Ho or Scott Marion, and you do these analyses um, to, to add before you release the results to see what you have, the state test data are not gonna be released in the aggregate until late July, I would say at the earliest. So then now what's your theory of action? If I need these data, if I'm gonna do something during the summer, maybe you're not, maybe you're gonna go for an intensive tutoring uh, sort of approach during the next school year. And then maybe those data could help you with, with data that are closer to the classroom. And so I'm not as convinced and you know, it's in my title, I'm, I'm the executive director of the Center for Assessment. So I'm pro assessment, but it's just, we have to think about how it's gonna get used this year. In states that have most of their kids in school, um, I, I think that they should be testing. I, I think the data will help us understand what went on with the pandemic. I'm just too nervous when we don't have, as clever as Andrew is, and I truly believe this, in terms of the metrics that he proposed, his three metric paper, and, and, and my colleagues are doing something similar. If you, all you have to do is look at the polling, political polling in 2016 and 2020, to know that even though those of us who like statistics think we have this secret sauce all the time, we know that it doesn't always work to make the adjustments because of these things we call unmeasured variables. So you choose to send your kid to school, I choose not. And even though we're both maybe in the same demographic, we made that choice for different reasons. And that's what we call an unmeasured variable that sort of nags, that's, that's one of my, that's big in my anxiety closet, going back to Bloom County. <laughs> Um, Lynn, do you want to comment at all about the experience you had with the, uh, the Biden administration, you know, on, on your your waiver and your plans for testing? No, I, I mean, I think I, I'm not as, um, you know, I, I heard what Andrew said about they could have emphasized, um, you know, the or pushed the um, uh, waiver even more. I, I think assessment directors in my position, we, we, once we kind of figure out, okay, what, what is it that they're really offering here and how do we navigate the system to ensure that we can serve our constituents the best? And I feel like um, everything that was put out allowed us to do that. I was thinking about my position. Had I been in a different state context where we wanted to go full force ahead and try to meet the 95%, would I have been able to do that in this administration? Absolutely. I mean, the conditions, I feel like it was, um, that they served the states well uh, in terms of the unique uh, context that each state might have been facing. I, 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 I think they did it as best as they could for mm -hmm. this, this situation. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, and Lynn, while while you have the mic, um, <laughs> do you you said a little bit before about context, but is there any other advice you would have for reporters this year in particular when results of some form come out? You know, what do you do with them? What kind of questions do you ask? Yeah. That sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, great. I think there's a couple of things that I would emphasize, and some which kind of was alluded to by or came to mind as I was listening to Scott's comments. One is make sure that um, when you, you know, if there are re results to report, that there is this deep understanding about the contextualization. What was the opportunity to learn in that state for students? What was the access to internet? What was the, what, was there other data that the state might have produced? For example, attendance data or uh, survey data from uh, teachers and parents and students. I know those are some of the data that, that we're uh, collecting at, at this point. But I would also say that um, I think part of the responsibility in reporting is to make sure that you're not just telling a, a data story around the years of COVID, but you're actually telling a story longitudinally. So for example, it would be such a, a miss if uh, the headlines in New Mexico that says, you know, uh, uh, ELs lagging behind compared to their peers 
uh, I, you know, historically, were they lagging behind compared to their peers even prior to COVID? Perhaps, yes. And so I think that's really, really important that the data story isn't just told based on the past two years that there is this historical trend that and that that can be realized within the media story. Um, you know, I'm going to be honest. I know that the gaps in New Mexico are long term and are historical. I, I don't need my COVID data to know that, you know, we're not going to make 20 percent gains in proficiency overnight. And, and so I think that's really important. The other uh, element that I would uh, encourage of reporters is to make sure that you balance it out with some bright spots. I think there's a lot of, um, uh, you know, trauma and uh, sadness that can be reported on around COVID, but there's also some remarkable things that our educators and schools have done. When we look at our, some of the data that we're asking our districts to share with us, we see those bright spots. We see districts in New Mexico that were trying to uh, put in standardized practices, even while administering assessments remotely. They, uh, uh, we see that there's some gains uh, visible in the state, but we also see pockets of regression. And so I think just to balance out those bright spots along with uh, the hardships that states have faced, it's important. Okay, thank you, Lynn. Um, Scott, Andrew, do you all want to just offer a, a, maybe a couple each of, of concrete pieces of advice for reporters this year when they get those results? Go ahead, Andrew. Take yeah, Scott, I mean, Scott mentioned a really important run, and, and it, it is like the first of my metrics, right? It's like the match rate, right? And when you talk about a census, you have to start by asking who's there. And ordinarily, that's a question that is answered by 95% of folks, so don't worry about it. This year, obviously, that question has to be answered first and foremost, and it is not the same across schools, and it is not the same within schools. Um, and so you ha we have to be very, very careful about the interpretation of those numbers. But I don't want to put that on you, the reporters. I want to put that, frankly, on Lynn and Scott. Right? I, want, I, want the, I want them to use the metrics to answer clear questions. Tell me two stories. Right. Tell me about the people who are there and tell me about the people who aren't. And the fun thing is, uh, not the fun thing, but the, the useful thing right, is that we actually know because of longitudinal data, right, who was there two years ago and who is there now. So I'm asking states to get on the on the uh, on the sort of front lines to anticipate the questions that you have, which are, again, sort of twofold. Tell me about tell me what you know about the kids who are there. Tell me what you know about the kids who aren't, because those are two very, very different populations. Right? And so I don't want to put it all on the reporters. And part of what I hope the reporters can do is, is put put a little bit of helpful pressure right on states and their vendors and their advisors um, to answer these questions in anticipation of what the public and policymakers need to know about where to, to direct support. In, and this is to Lynn's point, and we've talked about this a lot too, taking an asset-based versus a deficit-based framing, right? To sort of say, this is our opportunity to give support where we owe it right, where it's deserved and can be effective, right, and I think that is a, is a better frame than saying, you know, poor people who are, who are, who are lacking in some way um, need, need our help, and so I, I hope that we can, um, I hope that we can, again, take more of an asset-based framing than a, than a deficit-based framing. The, the other point I, I'd, I'd want to make here is be careful with remote scores, Right. I think I think there are going to be a lot of efforts to sort of say, oh, you took that like at home or potentially, I think, even more challenging. Oh, you took that district assessment. And so what we're going to do is just wave a magic wand and then call them comparable and report them together. So mm -hmm. I think it is the responsibility of states and their vendors and also us as the as the informed public to say, are you combining like with like here um, or, or have you done the work? What evidence do you have to support? the comparability right, of the tests when they're administered remotely or the tests that are administered in the district versus those state tests. Those are just sort of due diligence questions that, that, that states and their vendors should um, be forthright about. Um, but just in case you can ask questions about and say, hey, are you sure you have all the data you need because we don't have any evidence for the, for, to support the comparisons you're drawing? Okay, and just like a 15 or 30 second version of like, what would it be about the the online, you know, virtual remote test experience that would change the outcome in some way? 
the, the score. So Scott and Lynn both know about this, but the scores are likely to be on average higher than they would have been had they taken them in school, um, which may reduce our, our interpretation for how much support they need, right? When they actually need support, but they don't, right? But they don't appear to. Um, and so the reasons for that could be the sort of auntie and uncle and grandparent effect, right? Yes. <laughs> um, it could be other online resources that they have, um, and it may be disproportionate for some groups uh, over others. It's particularly true in early grades. It's particularly true in math, uh, mm -hmm. unless so English language arts, arts and reading. That's the early evidence uh, that we've seen. Um, ab above and beyond that, there could simply be blurriness, right? We just, they might just answer, you know, the scores may be comparable in unpredictable ways or incomparable in unpredictable ways. Mm -hmm. And that's what we would be concerned about um, in any quasi equating. Okay, thank you, Andrew. Um, Scott, I'm gonna ask you to respond. Yeah, okay. Actually, if you, before you do, um, so Stacia, if you wanna uh, come on in a minute, we'll, we'll have Scott answer this and then maybe we can get to the audience questions. Go ahead, Scott. Sure, so just, uh, just to emphasize Andrew's point. See, now you see my iPhone, now you don't, right? <laughs> so that's <sorry. laughs> the, the uh, one of the things that I would say um, to keep in mind, especially is, this is true always, but pay attention to variability. Right? Don't fall for averages. Uh, it was quoted recently in an Ed Week piece, right? In New England, we joke and say that on average, you know, you have one foot on a wood stove and another on a block of ice, and on average, you're pretty comfortable. And we're going to see more variance this year than we typically see. And we all nearly see a lot. So you should always pay attention to variability. And the other thing, just to put a, a finer point on what Andrew was saying about know who's testing, we know that in many states, school populations have diminished. So it's not just enough to say I have 70% of my kids who are technically enrolled this year testing, but my denominator actually shrank by 100,000 kids because they disappeared. And so it's important to understand that because they probably didn't truly disappear, but they're, they're, nobody knows where they are. And so that's critical. And the most recent example is one of our interim assessment friends, providers, just released a study. And the lead should have been, we didn't test 25% of the kids that we would have tested last year, not what the averages were. So good, Stacey. <laughs> Yeah, so there are a few questions um, from the audience I have here. The first one I'll read is from Patrick O'Donnell. Patrick writes, for states that have high stakes attached to test, third grade reading, graduation requirements, state takeover of schools, how many years after this year should these stakes be waived? How many years until we are normal? Once that one first. <laughs> Well, I, I, I'll take, for example, because we do have have had high stakes related to graduation and um, most state laws will say something to the effect of when a student enters their freshman year, the rules or the requirements of graduation should not change on them um, between their freshman year and, and, and senior year. And so what we've done is we have um, we have uh, waived the typical graduation requirements, which is really hinged on a demonstration of competency, typically a standardized test score. And instead we have said for uh, the, the current cohorts that course competency also is a uh, demonstration of competency and therefore they do not need an ultimate form of an assessment or some other uh, measure. And so um, I think states are um, probably varied in the way that they've approached that, but definitely we've had to, to extend um, waivers or come up with alternate policies in this interim period. So for things like graduation, it might be another two, three, or even four years, just depending on where students were in their cohort um, grouping moving forward. Mm -hmm. Scott, Andrew, do either of you want to weigh in? I, I just think that it's, assuming that we're just going to bounce back next year is tough. And I'm especially thinking about uh, states that have uh, these literacy gates. You know, you've got to pass a test in third grade reading to move on. And unless you know they've gotten, you know, a ton, a ton of interventions, um, that 
expecting that to be made up because I think that's probably for the kids who are remote early reading is probably one of the tougher things for them to have uh, stayed on track with and so I, I but there's ways to evaluate this and I just wouldn't set an artificial time uh, stamp out there and say 2023 things are going to be fine I think you just have to continually evaluate because one of the things we've learned through this pandemic is that our, our understandings constantly evolve. We should get more questions. I'm happy to throw my thoughts yeah. into chat. Yeah, go first okay. next time. Thank you. <laughs> sure. Well, I want to move to a question from Corinne Villalobos, who works at a Spanish language newspaper in North Carolina, La Conexión USA. And she writes about um, the Hispanic communities that she writes for not getting specific data from public schools, um, there being a lot of misinformation. Um, so how can journalists, um, her question is, how can journalists keep Hispanic communities correctly informed at this time about um, inequalities? Um, and what should be steps, what are some steps that should be followed to make sure that Hispanic communities don't feel excluded um, from these conversations? And I would add just any other, you know, communities, especially those with linguistic barriers. Good, Andrew. You go. You get to go last time. Yeah, I, I, um, I, I can't speak with any authority um, on uh, English English learner assessments, for example, which aren't my relative area of strength. Um, I, all I know is that the usual um, technical requirements we have for um, evaluating comparability still hold, right? And that and the first question we ask whenever we get test scores is is are do these mean the same thing they did last year? Right. Do these mean the same thing they did last year, right? And and that and and we have a number of of studies and, and analyses and and standards um, uh, for our field that ins that ensure that that comparability. Or if there is no comparability, we, we we rip it up and we start over again. And that's the big question for for this year. Um, and I understand. I think the balance always between um, the sort of uh, inclusion and uh, and and potential negative impact, right? Um, we want to count folks um, and make sure that they are, are part of our, our vision. Um, but we also don't want, want, we also want to make sure that when we do, we act in, in order to support them and not in order to, um, to, to, to label them and exclude them. Um, and so I think that that same principle applies here as it would uh, in other cases. Lynn, Lynn, I would punt it to you to talk more about the New Mexico context. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Andrew. And I would say for it's a great question. And I think one of the things that we've seen is uh, group advocacy. And so we have a number of um, Hispanic serving organizations, nonprofits that um, I think it's a it's a wonderful time for those types of organizations to kind of band together and uh, take um, in terms of like, trying to find out, you know, meaningful data or status of assessments related to those populations. Um, I think there's, you know, a, a, a unity or be able to leverage this information in unity is so important. We've had organizations here survey uh, specific, um, that specific population, and we, we see similar trends uh, to Andrew's point about, for example, um, uh, Hispanic families being very concerned about math progress or that as a content area compared to reading. Typically, we know that most parents in all populations struggle with math themselves, and therefore that's somewhat reflected in their concerns about their children. Um, so I would uh, encourage uh, the report that asked that question to uh, make sure that you're, they're using or they're kind of checking in with all the, the statewide associations of advocacy and support because sometimes what we see is they've done work or they've researched or they've collected data that could help inform the reporting. Um, and I do agree for, I think a lot of states, uh, the English language proficiency assessment, we know that's a particular assessment uh, required by the federal government that uh, it includes for in our state, both a lot of Hispanic as well as native students. And I think the double-edged sword on equity is, you know, if we didn't extend testing, then you're, you're not thinking about my child 
if you do, and re- if we actually require testing, then we're infringing possibly on their right to safety. Um, and so I think, you know, balancing that is a, an important understanding on a reporting aspect. Um, I talked to other state directors in which a lot of their uh, Latino advocacy was to ensure there was testing. Uh, the advocacy here in New Mexico was more leaning on the idea of safety and not wanting to make sure that vulnerable populations were forced into schools to test. And so I think, again, that's this is why we keep saying uh, over and over again, the context of your state and the con- needs of your con- constituency greatly matter in, in how and what you report. Thank you. Are there other questions, Stacia? Yeah, um, I have one for Professor Ho from Nancy Walzer. She asks, what do you expect to learn from state testing that hasn't so far surfaced from studies of learning loss? So um, the problem with many of the current studies of, of learning loss is that they're from selected districts and also they often blend sort of in-school scores and remote scores. Um, and these district assessments typically have different purposes, um, desirable purposes, but different purposes than state tests. And I've said in some of my writing that state tests have um, particular authority and comparability and coverage right across uh, districts uh, and schools um, within them um, to be able to allocate resources um, in, in, a, in a sort of fill in the gaps way um, that district assessments cannot. Um, again, I don't want to oversell state tests. Let me be very clear. This is what we've done throughout for the past 20 years is oversell state tests. Now we're in a strange position where all the backlash against them has led to them being undersold at a time where their comparability is particularly useful and with um, minimal um, uh, potential for negative impact, right? Or not not minimal, less potential for negative impact. Um, so I, I feel like we've sort of followed through with our, our um, justified criticisms of state tests, and now we're sort of hitting them just as they can be useful. Um, and so I think that, you know, do we have much of much of the information from district assessments? I think we maybe have 60% of it, but that's 60% of the information. And I think there's a lot that we can do with state tests to fill in the gaps if, if we report wisely. Um, and this is where I think Lynn and, and Scott and, um, and states and, and organizations can do so much more um, to make sure we're answering the questions about need and directing support as accurately as possible. Mm-hmm. Thanks. Um, I have one last question, but before I do, Stacia, is there one other from the, the batch you want to bring there's, up? There's one more. Again, it's for um, you, Andrew. Could you, it's from Andos Helms, who asked, can you give an example of how state, of how test results should direct resources? Are mm. you talking about allotments for school districts, schools, demographic groups, particular purposes? That's a great question. It really is, and I've. This is another. This is another area where I've tried to encourage feds to the feds to sort of say, how do you actually suggest that we take? You know, I've 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 got my little props for when I teach statistics. It's like one school, one school's like this, the other school's like this. This is where we direct support, right? And and their answer is, oh, is that how? Or I'm like, yeah, you got to be specific about how we're going to take these trends and say, no, 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 this is how we're going to allocate support. Now there are, are fu- the, these funding decisions, as you know, are incredibly complex and vary across different districts and states and, and systems. Um, and so I've taken sort of a hands-off position on uh, about this, um, but I've started to put forth a couple of sort of two-by-two two kind of plots that sort of says, between the kids for whom we have scores and the kids for whom we don't have scores, how would I allocate resources, right? And how would I sort of take this picture and sort of say, given what we know, this clearly is the school or the group or the community that needs the most support. Um, But it's basically, frankly, it's pictures like these that I hope we can draw accurately in a way that's not biased, right? Because if we just do report as usual, these trends might actually be like this, right? Had we measured everybody. And what our metrics can do is sort of say, no, 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 this is really what the answer is. And therefore, we need to support these kids. And I'm pleased to say I got a picture of that just now to share. There you go. Perfect. <laughs> hey, I just want to add one quick thing. I've been checking into this, Andrew. And as far as I could tell, most of the funding is still formula driven and less discretionary than we'd like to believe. So I hope somebody could tell me differently. 
Uh, that is true, but in the also oh, other other folks can. But there are some discretionary banks yes, there both are, for the there states are. and yes. and and the districts, yes. and that is a lot of money. And so I hope you can be thoughtful right. about it. Yes, I'm just gonna. So I, one last question, and maybe if you each want to give like a 30, 45 second answer to this, if you can. Uh, I know this could be a whole panel on its own, but you know, there's a lot of talk now about you know it's never going to be the same again in some ways. Um, What's the future of testing post pandemic? What do you think would be one or two of the most consequential changes? You know, are we never, are we going to move away from sort of the annual grades three to eight or rethinking or evolving into more competency based? Um, anyway, do you each want to kind of give a quick uh, Good one. prediction? <laughs> yeah, I'll just go first. Um, and you know, the assessment story has to follow the teaching and learning story, right? We assess it, it, over what has been taught. And I think that one of the things that we're seeing is the change in the instructional landscape. Um, as we, uh, one of the questions that we've been receiving, I'm sure all states are grappling with is, what is the future of virtual learning? There's a set of parents, or there's a population of parents out there once they've experienced learning in the pandemic remotely, that they are very content with uh, a learning environment that remains remote. And we have some districts here trying to solution, how do we keep our stakeholder base in our district? We now have to open a virtual school perhaps. That's actually a serious consideration. With that then, I mean, it's not as if we didn't have virtual learning before or they weren't online academies and we had to figure out how do we bring them in for testing. But I think more so than ever, it will push the envelope around remote testing. Um, right now, I, I, when we ask the question, can anybody substantiate the, that remote testing provides valid and reliable results? I think the research in that area for K-12 education is, is very, there's very little, if any, is in existence. Scott and Andrew would probably be the best sources for that question. But I think um, for states at, at a state level, if that is the will of a constituency, do we have to go down that pathway in terms of figuring out how do we, is remote testing something on the horizon that we need to be able to provide an offer? And so I, I think that it will, um, again, I think how assessment or how instruction has changed during the pandemic will inform how some of the changes happening in assessment in the future. More than 45 okay. seconds, sorry. That's okay, thank you. Uh, Scott? I'll just be quick. And so um, we're locked into a lot. We talked about accountability. ESSA is still the law of the land. It still requires these things called comparable annual term determinations. I'd love to see more experimentation around assessment, but it's gonna, I think that we won't see big changes until if we get a reauthorization that actually opens up assessment and accountability and not giving away the store by any means, but in ways that allow us to really try some uh, more interesting things. Right. So rewriting the federal law that has all these requirements on, on yeah. what tests do and, and the frequency yeah. and so forth. Um, Andrew, you have yeah, the final so word. I'm, I'm going to put in a, a little plug for this, um, for this little one pager that I, I wrote up this afternoon because uh, uh, Judy Singer and John Willett, who are sort of my senior colleagues here at, um, at HCSC, um, wrote a, gr a great um, primer on like questions that reporters should ask about educational research. And so I thought I'd do a twist on that and do things, uh, do questions that people should ask about educational testing. So I threw that into the chat and I, I'd love your feedback on it. But one of the, one of the first little diagrams I put in there that I, I to use when I teach is for what purpose? And you know, Scott knows that this is what our field asks all the time. It's like, what are you doing this for, right? Mm -hmm. And if we can get a little bit more strategic about when we're doing what and not try to do everything at once and have a tool for the particular job, and not have a hammer and just try to use uh, you know everything, uh, hammer on everything, I think mm -hmm. we could be much more strategic. And so I hope frameworks like this and thinking like this catches on um, because that'll help policymakers and the public be much wiser about the uh, um, about improved proving their use of test scores. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thank you. I'm going to make sure because I think that you put this in the chat just for our group. I'll make sure that we get it into the chat. Oh, no, it's to all the attendees. No, I think Looks I got like... it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. did it go in? Yeah. I hope okay. So at least. Yeah. Maybe. Okay. If if not, it's on Twitter. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, I'll, one way or another, we'll make sure everyone has it. So. Um, Thank you all so much. Uh, this was a great session. Really appreciate yeah. all of your time.
Um, and then just a quick, for the audience, you will get an email next week with an evaluation form, uh, including about this session. Please complete that survey. We take our member feedback very seriously. We care about assessment too. So, and we'll use it to improve our offerings. So thank you again to our speakers and to the audience. Thank you.